Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christina Hill. She's the director of the Landscape Architecture Program at the University of Virginia. Um, focuses on urban design, infrastructure design, water systems, and, and the connection and relationship with, um, between those and, and social and ecological drivers. She's from New England, like I am, so I'm going to be able to make fun of the fact that she went to Harvard. Uh, she has both her master's and her PhD from Harvard, and she went to Tufts as well. So with that, Christina. And perfect timing on the weather and the floods. So <laughs> you planned that as part of your introduction. I almost didn't make it because I had strep throat over the weekend. So if my voice starts to go, I'm, I'm not feeling just my doctor assured me I could go. I was not contagious, so I came. Uh, but I'm hoping that my voice will last. And I'll try to keep this drink here without spilling it. Um, I came from geology into design. And uh, as you probably all will agree, geology is the root of all knowledge. It's very important to design, to urban design. I go around the world trying to persuade people of this. Um, but it's helped me understand some of the issues related to climate change in a longer time frame, and even to approach cities in a longer time frame, which I'll talk more about because um, you know, geologists are always obsessed about how many billions of years it's been since this and this happened. Um, this map shows a change over time. This image shows a change over time between an old walkway in a warehouse district in the city of Hamburg in Germany, a series of old walkways, and the new walkway. The new walkway is set for the new flood height. So you can imagine where they're headed with how they've managed an urban district, and uh, it gives you a quick datum to understand how they're <coughs> dealing with some of those changes. Speaking about the figure, uh, is that a river or it is uh, it's a, flooding? Um, a river. It's the Elbe River, okay. and it's uh, not the estuary portion of it, but it is tidally influenced. <coughs> Um, kinds of floods that are important for urban design, of course, are the kinds of floods that support everybody. <coughs> Local rain-driven flooding, upstream rain-driven flooding that floods rivers, and then tidal storms are driven flooding. These are all things that affect coastal cities. They get the triple whammy of all three of those things. And it's very difficult to design a coastal city to <coughs> adapt to all those kinds of flooding. <coughs> this image is from Rotterdam's plans for its own future. You can see here the four kinds of water they're worried about. They have a uh, a major river coming through Rotterdam, that's the basis for their economy and their history, but they're really challenged now to figure out how to deal with storm surges from the North Sea, flooding in this river that comes all the way from the Alps, and the watershed is not in their national control. And uh, also think about their rising water table, <coughs> and what they expect to be more intense rainfall. We also expect more intense rainfall, as you all probably know. and uh, The regions of the country in red or in the darker tan color are expected to see some pretty significant increases in the frequency of relatively extreme rain events. Uh, the red zones are areas that this study predicted would go from being the one in 20 year storm to the one in four to six year storm. So we're expecting to see more intense rainfall. And that's a big problem for urban water systems where the drainage systems are typically already overtaxed and where there are combined sewer systems that are already generating combined sewer overflow events. Um, the idea of having five or six times more intense rain, um, more frequent uh, rain, is going to be a difficult one to imagine. Many of our streets and conveyance systems are designed for the one in 20 year storm. Um, but that means that they'll be overcome by a much more frequent storm, a one in five, a four to six year storm. So that means a lot more flooding and probably some efforts to adapt. Um, this, these data, I, don't, I actually, maybe some of you know where these data come from, but I have them from Bob Dolan, so that's my immediate source. And uh, what I find interesting about the data that have been amassed on global sea level, rates of global sea level rise in different places, um, is that the last 8,000 years has been a relatively slow and stable sea level rise rate. From an urban designer's perspective, that coincides with the era of human city building. So we actually have never had human cities in an era of rapid sea level rise. This is our first uh, attempt to coexist with rapid sea level rise. We've had urban, urban areas and areas of sea level drop. The Tigris and Euphrates area had a number of cities um, five, 6,000 years ago that were stranded as sea levels uh, went down relative to the land. And uh, that's an interesting model to look at for what you do when things get drier. But what you do when things get wetter isn't really something we have a lot of information about. So we can, unfortunately and unfortunately, look to Europe and to Asia to see what our future might be, because they have already begun investing billions of dollars in adaptation 
to a more rapid sea level rise. There are three basic strategies, as far as I can tell, having sorted through a lot of cities' approaches at this point. Um, we could build robust barriers around perimeters and pump groundwater out as it rises. And I would put Rotterdam, London, Tokyo, and Taipei in this category as models. Um, notice the word robust. So New Orleans is not in that category. <laughs> I, we could build flooding districts, which means that flooding could be allowed to come into cities in certain areas. I've listed Hamburg there, I list Rotterdam, but that's a little bit different case, kind of a hybrid. Rotterdam is allowing all storm surges and tides to come into the city. I mean, uh, <coughs> Hamburg. Rotterdam is only allowing um, fluvial flooding to come into the city, but not storm surge. And then we could abandon low-lying districts as they begin to flood more frequently and allow that frequency of flooding to change local economy and demographics over time. And that's essentially what's happening in New Orleans. Um, we're not taking an aggressive strategy there. We are only assuming a one in a hundred year event as the design event for the levees in New Orleans. And um, the city isn't being rebuilt. So some districts are in effect being abandoned, whether that's publicly acknowledged or not. And Jakarta is another city that faces some similar problems. And interesting to see an American city in the category of the third world city with a developing city. But um, in effect, that's where we are in the world economy at this point in terms of our adaptation investments, at least, infrastructure. We're, we're kind of a laughing stock. I go to these conferences around the world talking about infrastructure, and people from the UN will present slides of American stats on deferred maintenance of our infrastructure systems to make everyone else feel better about how well they're doing compared to the United States. It's sort of shocking. Uh, so what needs to 